Well, hello everyone and welcome to Painless Universal, a conversation with myself and Welsh. Today I'll be talking to Maria Tonga. She's a French origin now living in London. French art entrepreneur, speaker, media commentator, and founder of the MT Art Agency, an agency for the most talented artists. She's a fourth number 30 on the 30 and a philanthropist at Malika DRC and Choose Love. I'll be talking to her about where she got her passion for the art world, how we could get more women to develop that same passion. And most importantly, the visual of art. How can we get more people to stay and enjoy what they see from these creative, talented agencies? rather than spending all their time on non normal images on social media. I'm really excited that she's taken the time out to speak to us about her own talent, her own passion, and how she built her business. Meet Marie. Well, hello everyone and welcome again to Painless Universal, a conversation with myself and Welsh. Today's conversation, I think, is um, one that I'm truly excited about, especially to talk of everything that has to do with the art world. I've got Maria Tongi. She's all the way, she's a French artist. I think I, I, I would describe you as a French art entrepreneur. That's the way I, I see you as a French art entrepreneur. And she's done lots of speaking about visual arts is where I, I see your work really truly stands. And one of the issues today when we're talking to Marie is understanding how the arts, the effect of the pandemic for, 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 for starters, how we get more women into art and how we could truly make art a business. Because a lot of you know this don't understand art, but one thing we don't understand is the behind the scenes of the art and the, some of the work of these artists as well. Marie, thank you so much for joining me. How are you? Um, very well. As we were discussing, it has been an incredibly meaningful week. Um, and obviously there has been Women's International Week and months, as we know. Um, but it's also been um, an article in basically the lead paper for our sector, uh, mm -hmm. which has kind of snowballed everything for us. So you're seeing me on a Friday. Delighted to speak to you. And I know you've had a big week too. So hopefully this is a very nice and nurturing talk. Yes, and one, I think one at the end for the week, so I, I could, um, I would literally enjoy this. Um, before we get into anything arts, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Who is Marie? Um, so I think that's always a question where there's hundreds of words that can come in, right? I feel absolutely, um, you know, the entrepreneur behind MT Art Agency. We were the first talent agency in the art world. I've been in the art world for 12 years, so it's um it's in my stomach, you know. I, I want to change the sector. I want to um have you know spot the top talents, be the agents, um, build a team behind them and create the most extraordinary projects. But um I'm also lucky to be a mother, I'm also lucky to be a partner, therefore. I'm lucky to therefore also be a friend and have an incredible uh, community. So um they are getting all the different parts of me as as I'm sure you know yourself like you get you you give different parts um but I feel I feel very I'm at a stage in my life where I'm lucky to have all these parts and and to therefore feel very grounded by all the different parts of me yeah no absolutely and then as a woman as well that you find you you give so much in, in different sets or in different side of you and you just don't sometimes I, I always imagine how do we women put it all together and still come out effortlessly as if nothing has happened. But we, you know, you look truly amazing and you're, you're doing quite a great job. One other thing uh, I'm always fascinated about is women in art. I think when you think of art, you always think of men because those are the men who they, they've always been um, the one dominating it. You go on in Mayfair, you go to most of the art galleries they are mostly owned by men. You look at any agency, they're mostly men. The fascination of art always stems from men. A man feels buying art is is a rewarding thing for them but i don't i don't know how much women um, feel about it how did you find that passion to go into art um i feel that that's i think it's two different answers here there's a men dynamic and then there's um the passion for the arts so let's just start with the passion for the arts i think 
Um, I am someone that um, I had a very early awareness um, of mental health because I, I come from quite a broken background and um, I was aware that I needed a toolkit to help me, you know, just enjoy life and and make the best of it and, and dream and imagine and, and be happy. And I think books, art, anything like this were the escape. Um, and I, I could see how much happier I was getting from that, such as also kind of walking by the sea because um, I come from um, the seaside. So I think my passion comes from just the fact that it feels essential. It feels like a need to me. Like I don't feel I'm doing a job. I feel I'm very much um, supporting people who are inspiring me. And I hope we therefore inspire others through that. Um, so it's as old as generally being a kid um, and it's never left me and I've never been any different um, towards that. So it's an integral part of me that I need that. Um, I wake up in the morning and, you know, my house is completely visually designed and everything is here to kind of support me visually. So um, I'm definitely a visual being. I love visual storytelling. I love narratives that are built through visuals and all these things kind of really speak to me. Um, in terms of dynamic in uh, men wise, I mean, I think, so I am very competitive. I've always been very competitive with men. It just, um, um, it comes up for different ways. Like when I was little, um, we had to kind of do a run and I hated the idea that women and men were separated. So I was always running against men, but um, I've never seen myself, I've always said like, I'm very feminine as a person. You can see I have little colors, I love, I love dresses. I love being a mother, but I'm very genderless as an entrepreneur. I think the way I'm competitive is very genderless in the sense that, um, you know, when I was running against men, I just wanted to be, you know, the top runners. I didn't care whether or not I was a top runner as a woman or not. It just, I enjoyed the feeling of passing them. I enjoyed, I enjoyed that competitivity and, and that fairness of being able to compete together. So I think, um, that's a very much the same way I've run a business. That's the same way I've had male mentors. And one of them is, is publicly known. He's called Michael Levitz, who created CAA in LA. And he was one of the most powerful men in Hollywood at some point. And um, I think I've been nurtured by incredibly kind of alpha male. And I've enjoyed kind of the, the challenge. I've enjoyed being the person that plays the tennis game and, and has a bigger, better play on the other side, but is trying to learn really quickly. So I have, um, I have a good relationship with men from that point on that they, they give me a challenge. And, and I've, you know, when I was mentored by Michael Levitz and, and I never thought of myself as a female entrepreneur being mentored by a man, I just felt, how can I build a CA for the art world? How can I do what he's telling me? So I've, I've always felt very genderless towards all these questions. Um, I think obviously society is very different and, and the treatment that you receive is still different. But in how I felt personally, I never felt men or women in that situation. I just, I wanted to be people that I felt were really interesting. I wanted to absorb their knowledge and I wanted to be competitive. I wanted to do even better than they had done um, with the company. So I think that's, yeah, that's the relationship that I have with men. I think if we, if I look at my company, we, we very much 50-50, we have incredible men and women on board. Um, and everyone is united in that sense of working with the top talents and making the craziest, most ambitious projects out of them. Um, and I don't think hopefully any of them feels this is because there are men and women in the way they come behind that. I love that answer because I feel the same as well because I, when people ask me who are, who, who are you, I just say I'm Anna Welsh, that's it. I can't, I don't see myself, you know, people either stereotype themselves, say I'm black and this and that. I think I'm just a person and I don't want to put myself because that reduces my competitiveness, that reduces my ability to think of being competitive, between the, the ability to think I could do better. Because when you start putting restriction on this and this and this, then I said, I think you start getting that fear in you that because you're this, they thought society has always said, because you're this, you can't do that. So mm -hmm. you then limit yourself. So that's how I've always said, I'm just Anne Welsh and I can, I can only do what, what Anne Welsh is best at and that's why I could give and you before was asked I'm, I'm not laugh on my answer and I think coming from yourself Marie hearing yeah, that there's someone else actually feels that same way because I think the best way to learn is to learn with the best 
it doesn't matter if they're man or woman or whatever, wherever they're from, but it's always best to learn from the best. And I think this is how we could always step above it. Um, so what led you on to now start your business, the um, MT, MT Art Agency? I think, so there's so many things that led me on. So I was six years into my career at the time. Um, my first boss when I was 21 was Steve Lazaridis, who discovered Banksy. So I was managing his gallery called The Outsiders for him. And um, I was getting exposed to a new breed of artists, very much street artists. So JR, um, Banksy, all those guys who were not just making headlines in the fine arts world, but they were also inspiring kids on the streets. And there was something very different about that. I think my first boss was also from a council estate, which was incredibly rare for the art world to kind of be able to do that. Um, so I got very lucky because again, um, coming from not a background of wealth, like, I think getting exposed to someone who had done it was just super helpful um, to kind of think you can. Um, and then when I was 23, I was approached by an investor as I was still running the Gary for Steve. And that investor loved the way I came across, loved the way I was accessible when I talked about art and the way I was kind of pitching the talents and, and the sales I was making. So he offered me an investment deal where he will be investing in me opening my own art gallery in Los Angeles. So I will be moving from London to LA. And then I would therefore be earning a gallery on Melrose Avenue, which at the time was named after the small island I come from, which is Dore, uh, Ile de Ré in France, so Dore Gallery on, on, in Beverly Hills. Um, and so I got sent to Los Angeles to open my own art gallery. I feel it's just, again, it goes back with um, the way I perceive the arts. I kind of, I had this incredible gallery, it was pretty beautiful and I was behind this very lux luxurious desk, um, but I was waiting for opportunities. I was not um, going out there to get them. Like a gallery is a very passive beast, you know, it's just not a very active beast. And then I was I was lucky to kind of meet Michael at the time, Michael Rivets, and, and the way he was describing how he will go and get deals and packaging them for his talents and, and the energy that was going into that felt much more like because um, he had sold the business back then, but he was still able to describe how he had built it. And I think that felt much more what I wanted to do as a job. I didn't want to just wait for opportunities. I wanted to kind of create opportunities, be creative about them and package them and, and build my talents much faster and much better that way. So I think talking to my talents at the time, talking to my clients, I felt that the Gary model was sadly a bit outdated and the talent agency model felt a lot better in many for many reasons economically because it could grow much bigger much faster um but also it could deliver opportunities that were also much more exciting for my artists and that's something that obviously was really important to me so um i left my first partnership um which at the time was completely mad for people because um, we were in the papers and, and you know, I, I, was, I, I was seen as very lucky already to kind of have done that, you know, and but I, it didn't feel right. And, and I'm just very lucky to have listened to my instinct at that point. And so I therefore um, decided to leave and, and from the first time agency that will ever exist in the visual arts. And, um, and yeah, and we are five and a half years later. I'm just delighted to have taken that decision um, as much as it was a very risky one, obviously. Um, and our business has been one of the fastest growing in the sector since. And, um, you know, we've been able to attract talents who are literally incredible. Um, and, and yeah, it's just, it's, um, I'm just really delighted. I think it's, it was a, I was very bold in, in my twenties. Um, and I'm glad I've listened to that uh, because, you know, anyone who was a bit older was seeing the, re the risk I took as, yeah, just completely mad. Um, and then now, obviously, we are benefiting from this risk. And I don't even know if I could take half of this risk today because um, we have so much more to lose uh, in the establishment of the business. So it's, um, it's a real luck factor. But I think I was also able to take this risk because I was mentored by people who were incredibly ambitious and, and incredibly impressive. So they were leading the way on showing me that it was worth taking risk and and risk could be rewarded as much as obviously it's painful if it doesn't work out. Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, in a business, in one of the things I, I, I think people always struggle with is finding that appropriate talent, like in the art world. How, how do you manage to 
find talent and not just find talent, retain the talent? Yeah, I mean, that's a very good question. I think we finance the studio cost every month and we do offer generally the best support is right now for most of the sector. So obviously if you go to Gagosian, like they will be offering top opportunities. But if you put aside the 10 first galleries, we now are a place where the times we're getting the better deals. Um, to give you an idea, um, Seipe, one of our artists, we were able to obtain the Sean Mars in Paris, which is 800 meters of land, and then get the Eiffel Tower and the Guardian as media partnerships to partner on that with him. Mm -hmm. So that will be a level for Seipe that he couldn't get anywhere else in the sector. Mm -hmm. So I think thanks to that reputation, we now get 200 artists applying every month. Um, and we have a selection committee that kind of goes through this. Now, of course, the top ones are not applying. The top ones are to be courted and, and I'm absolutely ready to be courting them. You will see soon we're announcing very large talents who just left their very much the top galleries to join us. And we haven't yet made that announcement at least over the coming weeks. Uh, that requires courting. Um, but I love courting talent um, because I, a lot of people who are talented, I have a genuine respect for that. Um, and the more ambitious, competitive and talented they are, the, the more I want to be the person that, that goes after them um, and same with my team. So, and in, in regards to therefore um, stay competitive, I think our hope is um, as we continue to grow, we can be competitive for all talents um, is the answer. But that is, and so the retaining, I think the retaining is a bit different as, an, as, as a question because you know, a talent is by definition not the most stable person in the entire world. Um, so I think there's, a, there's the answer to retaining them competitively, and that I'm very confident about. There is also the question on how do you deal with the highs and lows emotionally? Um, because, you know, sometimes talents don't make rational decision towards their career. So even if you present them with the best opportunity, they may decline that, you know? So the, the way you go about this is much more psychological. Um, and I've, I've kind of, I'm 12 years in, so I feel I've seen, I've seen people that have dropped, yeah. then they've reappeared. Um, so I'm also confident in the highs and lows emotionally to kind of calm over time. And I'm confident in timing being also something that can turn it around. Uh, two of my talent, Walter and Zaniel, um, who maybe, um, whose works have been acquired by the National Portrait Gallery of the V&A Museum. So they, they've got a great reputation here in London. Um, we worked together at the start, then, you know, they disappeared a bit and now they re-signed in. Um, so, you know, there are talents and that's okay. Like our job is to make sure that we stay competitive. We manage them with the best empathy possible. We are there for them as a support system. But I think I would also kind of say that, you know, it is expected that, that there will be um, movement because that is just the nature of what a talent is. No, I love that you talk about empathy, empathy because um, there's a lot of empathy that has to go with, with managing of, of individuals of any kind. So what has your exposure to art um, done for your empathy? I think, you know, um, I'm actually a very emotional person. I think it's, it's funny because I think when I started my business, I was seen as, um, I think people were so shocked that, they, that the young woman wanted to start this and disrupt the sector, that I was so often labeled as someone who had no emotions because it was seen as such a non-woman thing to want to do, to be so disruptive. Mm -hmm. um, but as a person, like I cry on every advert that is possible and on any stupid movie that was ever created. So I just, I think there's empathy in regards to, I feel for people and then there's decision-making. So you can feel for people and still having to make a decision that's not easy. Um, and those are two different things. Um, and I think as you grow older, you learn to be, you know, kind, even in conflict, um, supportive, even if actually you're about to say to someone that you may not work together any longer. Um, and that is that is what really what experience brings forward to you in terms of that empathy is that it's, you know, you, you are able to kind of relate to people who are very different to you, still take decisions that are not easy, but still retain the fact that you care for them and you can go out of your way personally, separately for that person. Yeah. Um, so I think that's all things that you learn. I'm sure I'm just at the start of my learning for it. Um, it's always incredibly hard because my time called me at 10 a.m., at 10 p.m., weekends, 2 a.m. And, you know, 
they they are not i think the the thing i would always say to anyone starting our business you cannot expect gratefulness um because i think it will come in a, very rarely um they are people who have to be um centered on what they're trying to do and centered on themselves therefore which is goes with the job but i think i see a lot of juniors from our business will sometimes get upset to not be recognized for having gone 300% the extra mile. So again, I think empathy maybe in my job is to understand that, is to be there for the other person and not expect that to ever come back to you because you know that the value that they bring into the world is, is something that's very special. Yeah. Um, and that's something I'm still learning to deal with because I think there's definitely actions that are being made that sometimes are not very pleasant, especially when you haven't um, slept for very long at that point. Yeah. Um, but I do generally believe that every single one of them is delivering so much value to as a human being so that I would be willing to take that on um, because I do think the art is incredibly inspiring. And that's a contract that I have personally with that job. Um, and I encourage everyone who is doing that job to therefore have an understanding of what that contract is um, to be able to deal with it um, with the empathy and with the mental health as well. Yeah, I love that. I love the way you answer that, that there is the, the, the artist that you sign on who you have to be empathetic to because of his way of dealing with things and they might never come back and say thank you because they just want to go, go, go. And there's the employee side where you also have to be empathetic to them because they work so hard on making sure this artist gets what they want and they want that recognition. So it's how to balance that off. And I yeah. really like that because a lot of us don't think about empathy in that way. We see empathy, we just say, okay, we just need to be kind. We need to be, no, empathy is understanding when human is calling your name. Human is calling for you to listen and understand that at this point in time, I'm going through something very difficult because I've just done all this work and I didn't get recognized for it. Could you sympathize with me? So I just love that you separated, you separated your answer in empathy into two because it's that would be the clear. Yeah. It's a trust in time because time usually um, kind of evens out that recognition, like time does the job. Um, I also always encourage them, therefore, to read the book of my mentor, Michael, and also another book on contemporary art called Boom, um, because there's a great moment in, in the first one where Cher, the singer, uh, thanks her hairdresser when she received his, she received a Grammy mm -hmm. and her agent Ron Mayer which was a partner of Michael at the time at CA mm -hmm. just gets so upset because obviously it's taken him like years to kind of get that moment and I always use it as an example of my team to just be like you need to prepare yourself for that share moment where they just she's going to thank her hairdresser and you spent eight years because you really believe that person could do it but I think that's the thing is we're not we're doing the job beyond the talent. We're doing the job so that people can be inspired when they see the art in yeah. the same way that Cher has made us dance many, many times. And whether or not she thanked her agent is irrelevant. It's about the fact that she has made us smile and dance. And that's that's the way to look at it, I think, um, from a mental health perspective. That is wonderful. Um, your, uh, one of the focus of your agency is that you very much support women. And you do lots of work with female artists on your, and this one, I think you did one particular on art female future. Why this drive towards um, empowering women? I mean, I think it's interesting because I don't consider myself as specifically looking at my female artists as female. Um, I think in the same way that, and I think they align with me on that, I never wanted an, a talent agency to just represent women because they're like me, they want to be the top artist. I don't want to be the top female artist. I want to be the top artist full stop. Um, and I want to be the top entrepreneur full stop. So it's, that's the way I treat them. I treat them and maybe that is the reason why they succeed. I treat them as equal to my male artists. There's no difference um, whether one is the user. And maybe that is where empowerment comes from is out of a female founder, I, they do get equal opportunities. They do get similar treatments and, and there's no, you know, there's no, they, I just want them to succeed equally um, and strive equally. Now, of course, I think the difference in terms of, again, back to empathy, I think I, when one of them is pregnant or goes through things that only women go through, then I will be extra careful on making sure that they are okay as well psychologically, because I understand that there are different things at stake. I think that's the difference between my company whose values are just equality. And me as a person, um, 
you know, wanted to be extra supportive because I know that there is still a, a treatment from society that is different. But when it comes to my company, we just we're just doing the same for everyone. It doesn't really matter um, what genders they have. Mm. And I think that's what will also produce the best as well, because we just need it in art, what people just want to pay for is that you get a piece of art, you just want the best, you want to get something you're really attractive and you want them to give your best work, it doesn't matter who they are, man or woman. The effect of COVID-19 um, COVID and the pandemic, I think it has had a um, drastic effect on the artwork, because things that you could easily just go to, um, you know, Na National History Museum and wherever, and just display your work. Now that has totally changed the way artists are doing their work. Also creativity. A lot of people have found that the lockdown has changed their way of thinking, their creativity is not as what the way, way it should be. How have you managed to tackle that? Yeah, um, so I think like it's, the, the role of arts and culture is, it's always been quite tricky because it, let's just take the UK situation because I think sadly the role of arts and culture is quite changing depending on which country you're in. Um, in the UK, it's very class based. So if you are from a very wealthy background, you get exposed to it more at school through education and private schooling, but also through your parents and um, and you will be much more familiar with it. So I think for me, it's a real class issue more than it is again a gender issue about it. Um, in terms of its, the effect on COVID, I think it's accelerated this. It's accelerated inequalities upon who was able to access, who was able to still strive, who was able to, all of these things kind of get um, kind of pulled over. But it's, it's also one thing to remember that therefore um, two thirds of galleries were not making money pre-COVID. Um, I know that the obvious answer is to say poor galleries, which I completely understand. And I'm not saying that because I'm a talent agency, but it's not good to be in a sector where most businesses are not profitable because this basically means that only very wealthy people can start a business. And that is where I'm always saying, yes, of course, you know, it is sad to hear, but it also means it needs to change because if we don't change that, if we have a business model that is not successful, and it basically means that only someone who can afford to lose money is going to be able to be an entrepreneur in my sector. So for, for me, it's going beyond the conversation of let's save the business models that are existent and it's more or less reinvent and let's secure the future of the arts with businesses that are actually striving, that are actually profitable because we can't just constantly go back on either the charity angle, either the fact that only people who can afford to lose money can be in that sector, because that basically reduces the arts back again to a tiny fractions of individuals. Um, and that's where the economics and socials for me align where, you know, I hope that COVID highlights that it's time to be different in that sector, that yes, the, the impact was even harder, but in fact, even pre-COVID, a lot of these things were not working out. Um, and we need to think, how do we convince why the demographics, why the urgencies that arts matter? How do, how do we therefore develop an economics that justify this and that supports the fact that the, the urgencies are there? And how do we nurture a new type of um, like a new type of entrepreneurs and businesses? It's the only way to save this because it's already been dormant, it's already been not working. Like a lot of the museums, they've so been concentrating on just the wealthy mm -hmm. that the, the donors are very old and the new generation from that, the same families are not very keen to donate as much. They prefer to be investing in companies, investing in impact companies. They're not as keen to be part of that. So we need a full rethink of We've now made the arts just about elitism. Can we just break that, make it about being more inclusive as hard as it is, because it is hard. Um, and I think the example for us where with triple revenue last year shows that there are alternatives. It's not just ours, but there are alternatives. But the the alternative is again, this, the future of the sector, like the talents that are part of my company, the employees that are part of my company can be from any backgrounds because they have a job that pays them. And therefore they can make sure to spread the arts to any of these audiences. It doesn't matter if daddy and mommy are supporting it or not. And that's just beyond important um, where the sector doesn't have enough renewal or demographics that can work for it or 
um, buying into it. So, you know, it, that's always a difficulty because I'm quite um, strongly opinionated, but I think it's to remind as well from a women perspective that only 15% currently of buyers are female in the traditional art market. Already in models like mine, we have 50%. And that means new demographics are not going for the tradition. They're going for the new propositions. And so we need to make sure to endorse as many new inclusive, inclusive models as possible, because that will be the future of the economics as well of the sector. Yeah, that's true. Um, you, you know, I've never thought about it that way. You, you think of art, but I know that it's really uh, elite class that tend to go to these art museums, that tend to sponsor it. And the artists never really embrace the, uh, the non other class, the lower class, they've not really embraced. And, and in light of um, the pandemic, we're hoping that they have to open up and see and see different ways of attracting the other, other kind of lower class and middle class in, into this sector and also to also create and involve them into their creativity, creativity as well. One of the things you said, you, you know, you believe the art sector needs change. And I think you've done something you roughly said now around the language. What do you mean around the language of the visual arts? You talk about so much um, visual art, art. <laughs> Yes, I do. Um, that's a very good question as well. So, um, so okay. So normally people think of the arts under the art world, um, which is not a sector. It's like a world, and this feels like you know this is one of the only non-regulated economical markets. It feels very mysterious. Um, for me, a visual is not just art. It's um, it's like looking at nature and being very inspired by that. It's any visual environment. So you opening your phone and looking at images that makes you feel happy or insecure or anything is a visual. Mm -hmm. You look, being in a house or being on your streets or going to nature, that's a visual. Um, I want to be part of my business as a visual conversation, not just the art world conversation, because I think there's so much more impact on the visual conversation. Currently in London, we have nine public art projects where if you go via Regent Street, you see 12 meters of the exhibition of Delphine Diallo with our French Senegalese artists. Mm -hmm. And that's us being part of the wider visual conversation because whoever is passing that street, doesn't matter if they care about art, are being impacted visually. And the visual conversation is way broader. It's how do we look after ourselves? What's our visual diet? How do we care for that? So if I wake up on the morning and I'm only looking at women accounts that makes me feel insecure. That's me basically not looking after myself visually. Um, and that's just something that I can tweak really easily by going onto accounts that will make me feel um, visually much more inspired. So I talk about this because I think the reason we've parked art just in the art world is reductive of the impact that the arts can have and the impact that artists can have. If we think of it as a wider visual world, what artists should really take part in that conversation. So again, think of Vision Street, how incredible that the high street will not just be a place where you shop, but it's also a place of community and public arts and sustainability and all these exchanges take place. Mm -hmm. Then suddenly the visual conversation is much more relevant than whether or not someone can enter the art world, which feels like so tiny and, and so not impactful in, in, in his demographic. So, I think for us, it's it's really just important that we we have this wider visual conversation and we impact this wider visual conversation. And as much as my artists have museum shows, as much as they have amazing uh, prices and and they rise and it's all great, I also want them to inspire the kids on the streets and anyone who is not part of this world. And that is that is a very yeah, it's super important. And that's the reason why we also B Corp as a business. Like it's, we don't just see ourselves as part of this. We see ourselves as part of a larger visual narrative. Now we're coming to the end of the interview, but there's just two things I need to ask you. Um, you said very clearly on the, I think it was one of your TEDx talk, and I love that. You compared it to the, you know, the Instagram people who come, you know, have so much followers, but another um, thing is like the, um, arts arts that people have been passing through for many years they've been there arts uh, art museums that have been there for many many years are, are not in that league so i think you were trying to compare the two uh, i would just i'd love you to talk about that because i i wasn't quite clear i understood what you were saying because it made sense and i i, I saw it in a different light i'm like actually that's true the arts has a story they show us so much compassion you can see different things but People don't recognize people, people, the young are not connecting to it. 
rather they connect him to these in in the individuals on Instagram who are posting all kinds of pictures and that's what the young people so how do we change that language to engage more younger audience into the other world yeah um I think that's a very fair question and it's really where um I am frustrated with this country because it's an educational question um and my story has happened from low middle class to the art world because I was educated in France and not saying France is the best country France has hundreds of flaws like any other country but it's I was able to access, um, you know, the arts really early on, whether I was a rich kid or not, it didn't really matter. Like you go to state schooling and you have the success. Um, this is where it becomes really problematic that that education is not across the board, that certain types of languages, like the visual language, is not, is not accessible. So um, on the question of how do we make accessible, so I've just finished writing a book, which is, currently going through so many back and forth with my publisher. So it's a very new experience for me um, on the visual diet question. And, and the way I, I hope I'm going to add value to this as an answer is one, I look at visual um, history. So it's not art history, it's visual history. So if you're born again in a council estate, what are you looking at every day? How are these visuals, how is this architecture, how is this what you're looking at from advertising, professing everything? is shaping the person that you're going to become. And I could put different um, exposure and cultures and backgrounds in the first part of the book to show that sadly it incredibly shapes you. What you are looking at will shape you, will make you a, a specific person. And that is a problematic of therefore not being aware of that. So the second part of the book is looking at um, what are the tools? How do I know that images affect me? So if I look at an image super quickly, and there's like some red to it. So there's a structure and the position of the image. And I feel a desire to act after this or something a bit anxious about after this. There's a reason, like the image is making me do that. How do I learn to decompose that image um, in a structure? And how do I have a radar for that so that I don't just get passive and don't realize I'm basically being manipulated was that knowing that I'm being manipulated. Because um, again, I think the issue of a, a language, if you don't understand the language, mm -hmm. that's where it affects you. If you obviously uh, can take part in the, in the language, that is much more positive. So that's the third part of the book is looking at how can you take part? How can you be more participative of it? How can you learn to curate um, your visual diet so that it affects you for the better, nor than the worse? Um, and you start engaging in conversation with brands, with the public sector with everyone on the images that therefore empower you, make you feel better, like um, make you a lot happier. So it's it's lengthy because it has to be lengthy. I hope that from the book, we can break it down in really little easy tips, uh, tips as well. Um, I've hated writing a book because I'm so ADD as a person. So it's really not, um, it's not my best. Um, <laughs> But it's, but I really believe I had this in my stomach since I'm a tiny girl because this is this is what has helped me, and therefore it's important for me to be able to pass it on. So I I hope that this is one step to pass it on, and then we can start decomposing. And of course, long term, I would absolutely love to be able to support more the educational system in doing that. Um, and I'm already doing that as much as I can um, behind the scene on the charity level, and it's it's essential because basically my kid is currently growing up with a diversity of visuals. That means he'll be better and have more self-awareness to that impact and less manipulation towards it. There are kids who will grow up with, you know, an exposure to certain types of adverts and visuals, which will put them in a less likely position to lead later and to be empowered later. So it's, it's that is where the inequalities, um, it just boiled my stomach about it because it does really create very large inequalities later as adults. Yeah, you are so right there. It's that inequality that we need to really address. And also the education gets seen how kid and schools can incorporate it. And I know some schools are starting to do it. They go to kids, go to different um, museums or, or, or trips, but it's the follow up with the parents as well to make sure there's that and talking about it so that they could um, make a conscious effort to look at it. Now, our final question is that um, a lot of talents are in Africa right now. There's so much um, up and coming artists in Africa right now. But the thing they have, the biggest challenge they find is that reach, not knowing 
what next or how to nurture, or how to do these talents. What advice would you give to anyone out there who's listening to this, going to listen to this conversation that is absolutely very good at what they do and they've been praised, they've probably been showing off at them, showing off their work in um, various events, but in Africa, but wants to step that, make that leap of faith into the international world. What would what think, advice would you give them? I think internet is for that is uh, life savior. Like when I started, you couldn't just have an Instagram account. Um, I think we do as agents and managers uh, do kind of scan through Instagram all the time. So there's definitely ways in which hopefully that can bring awareness to the works. And I know collectors do the same. I know partners do the same. Um, I would really kind of um, reflect on what am I bringing that is unique? What is unique about me? Like, what can I, because, you know, I would hate for them to, as you know yourself, like Africa is not a country, it's a very large continent. The idea of just being an African artist is frustrating to everyone involved being an African artist in the first place. So how how they're unique with their technique, how, what's the narrative that they bring that nobody else has brought in? How do they contribute to the conversation in a way that's really innovative and, and really special and really kind of highlight that when discussing the art because mm -hmm. I think that's the best way. It's the same with female artists. You, you don't want to just be a female artist part of the female conversation. You want to have that story that's really yours and that you can bring forward. So just making sure that when they do communicate about their work, they're very clear about that. They do search for, okay, all these artists have done that. What is it that I'm doing that's differently? What is the style that I'm bringing forward? What is the message I can therefore bring forward? Um, and, and make sure people understand that. Um, and then, you know, like we started in a place where um, the art world was not so keen to have us. And obviously now this is fine. Everyone is friends again, but in reality, um, it, when people don't hear of you in the first place, building communities, building your own communities um, is important. And even if there are people in the art world, having a supportive community is so important. So it doesn't matter if that's people who live next door. Um, it's important to start nurturing people who are going to be a support network because that's so required to last in any career. So the third thing is to just make sure that therefore they are building and they are grateful for that support network. And so that that support network can constantly talk about them and help them leap over to hopefully where the game changing decisions can happen. Um, I really wish them the best of luck because I, I love your answer. The internet is open. There's so many ways to reach anyone now. I've reached so many artists and just through the internet and they've been in remote part of the world and they've all re uh, reached out to me one way or the other. So I, I totally agree that the world is becoming smaller. You just need to surf a little bit and you find the right answer there. And if your work is really, truly good enough, there'll be someone out there who will reach out back to you. So thank you so much, Marie Penga for this amazing conversation, opening and shining a light on visual art, especially, because I think that's something that a conversation that has to be, has to be had. And, you know, people can, we need to keep talking about it. So people understand that we, the more you engage and what you look at is what you become. And it's something we, is, you know, it's as simple as that. What you continue staring at is what you, you give your attention to and you give the power to it, especially with this mental health. Thank you so much for your time. Any final words? Me and absolute well done for you because you've been moving mountains as well recently. So uh, well done for you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much as well.